Hey, insiders. Ever wondered how you can benefit from having your music with music libraries? Well, if you have, then you don't want to miss this episode with Ron Mendelson, president and CEO of leading independent music library, Megatracks. We discuss the changing role of music libraries in film and television today, as well as the growth of several additional platforms and outlets for music in today's landscape, and much, much more. Stay tuned. This episode of the Mubu TV Insider Video Series is brought to you by the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label A&R, music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 30 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a r Registry, the Film and Television Music Guide, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. We managed to catch up with Ron Mendelson, the founder and CEO of Megatracks Music. Ron, thank you so much for doing this. My I really pleasure. appreciate it. My pleasure. Talk to me about music libraries. The role of the music library has so significantly changed in the last 10 years as far as you know its usage in film and TV. It's always been around, but now the role of libraries and the filtering system that they provide, I think, has become much, much more important in the world of sinks. Would you agree or? Absolutely. Libraries are playing much more of a role as a curator um, these days because there's simply so many music choices out there and music supervisors and editors and producers, they're just completely overwhelmed with the number of choices. There's buyout sites out there. There's non-exclusive uh, brokers of, of music out there. <laughs> Uh, there's traditional uh, production music libraries out there. There's independent artists. There's commercial catalogs. Everyone, it seems, is peddling music in one way, shape, or form out there. So to a large extent, libraries are serving much more of a curation role and really helping users hone in on exactly the right tracks for their project. So, so they don't get uh, a wash. You know, it's just an, an endless, infinite uh, choices of music because that's essentially what's out there these days. You know, one of the things that I, I want to ask about the, the library, uh, music libraries is, is it your experience that today the demand for music is, has a much wider variety to it than in years past? Absolutely. Absolutely. When, when we started in the early nineties, it was really all about television and really all about, you know, promos and commercials and programs when we started and fill in film to some extent. And then the internet came along. Then it, there's all kinds of productions on the internet. Uh, now there's, there are mobile, mobile devices out there and productions on mobile. And now the latest frontier is social media, which is uh, starting to explode for us. And we're seeing all kinds of music licenses uh, on uh, every possible social media platform. So there's all kinds of different platforms, which has really, uh, translate into a proliferation of clearances, licensing clearances, and it may, it's made licensing a lot more complex and, and complicated. Do you have, do, when you come to a company like Megatrax, is it a one-stop shop in terms of, you know, what you're going to be licensing, you're licensing Lock, Stock and Barrel, Sync and Master? Absolutely. That, okay. That's always been the benefit of working with production music libraries. We own all the sync and master rights to all of our music. Absolutely. Okay. Owner control, I right. should say. Okay. Which makes the clearance like not an issue if, if you're the one that they have to come to to do it. It's just one person. It's done. They don't have to go to a publisher. They're a, la a label of, you know, like with songs out in the... Precisely. Place. And that, that's always been the historic benefit of working with production music libraries. But the, the thing that's changed over the years, I just like to add, is the quality of the music that's out there from the better libraries. And I like to include uh, Megatracks in that group. What we're producing, it's really blurring the lines with commercial music right now. We're working with top film composers. We're working uh, with top independent artists 
And, you know, you'd be hard pressed to say, oh, that's a library track. Oh, that's a commercial music track because the lines are blurred to such an extent. It's not like years ago where library music was considered to be canned music or stock music. Right. Uh, there's some very, very fine quality material being released by the top libraries these days. No, I, I fully agree with you. And, and the other distinction I would make to, to your statement is that there are specialized libraries like extreme music or, you know, um, ones that focus on, uh, uh, um, international music or ones that have, as you said, a much broader scope of things. But no, definitely one of the things I've heard from a lot of music supervisors over the years is that the library games have, the library uh, game has really upped their quality. They've really upped, I mean, where it's, you know, you wouldn't listen to that and say, oh, that came from a library and this didn't. Exactly. You know, so. Yeah. And part, part of that is due to the collapse of the traditional music industry. Okay. Where a lot of, a lot of talent, a lot of independent artists, they can't be signed by a, a record label anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, they don't have the, uh, the, the, uh, album sales as a source of income anymore. So they're looking for other revenue sources. And very often they, they turn to libraries because libraries are a growing field in the industry. You know, it's interesting to hear you say that because one of the things I've heard, I've heard now two music supervisors at two different events talk about this uh, when you talk about, you know, major labels, is that they have noticed a trend among film producers and television especially not to license some of the contemporary hit songs that are out today in terms of the charts. And the main reason there's too many entities involved. Every song is written by four or five people. Right. Nobody wants to call Sony, Warner Chapel, right. Universal, and Peer Music to right. deal with one. It's just not going to exactly. happen. Exactly. So they'd say, no, I, you know, I don't care who it is. I, right. I'm not interested. Right. And that seems to be a real problem for the contemporary, you know, big hit songs of the day in right. terms of getting any kind of potential use beyond right. that. Right. And that's always been the case. But like any music supervisor would tell you, there are times when they need to have that song. Right. And a substitute or proxy will just will not do. And then you have to jump through other hoops and get all the necessary clearances. But more often than not, uh, you don't need to have that one song. And there's plenty of other substitutes available. And that's where libraries come in. Precisely. And also libraries, you mentioned the word curator when we started. The other thing that I think is fascinating about libraries is that not only are they a curator, but many music supervisors will tell you and have mentioned in the past that if people want to get their music heard, rather than just inundating them with thousands of song submissions, they said, you know, you should go to your, your, get your music to a library, a reputable library that we do business with, right. that we know we will be much more likely to listen to something from mega tracks or something from someone else. Rather than, you know, also it's a time issue. I can't go home at night and say, I'm going to give you three hours of just listening to some solicitations, solicitations of my computer. Of course, it comes down to music supervisors only have time to deal with trusted source. And trusted source, by definition, is a company that's come through for them in the past and not made them wade through uh, uh, inappropriate content and has curated for them content that's been useful for them in the past. So we like to think, we, we as, aspire to be a trusted source for uh, music supervisors, and they just don't have, there's not enough time in the day to listen to every composer or every artist out there or every indie label that, that is drawing tracks at them. Right. H how do you, as a company at Megatracks, you guys must get Lots of submissions, and some of them probably are good. Some of them aren't. But how do you at your company deal with that process of filtering through things that are coming to you for possible inclusion in your library? Um, well, I think our company would probably grind to a complete standstill if, if we had to uh, seriously evaluate every single composer submission. And we'd, we'd have to have like an entire building full of people evaluating content. So what's worked for us in terms of efficiency over the years is we we have honed a core stable of composers, a core roster of composers that consistently deliver top-notch work time and time again, and we know who they are. We know who to call if we need an urban track. We know who to call if we need a dance pop track. Uh, we know who to call if we need a large-scale orchestral session with choir. So we've honed a certain roster of extremely 
talented and, and dependable composers that we turn to. Occasionally, if there's a new style that crops up on the charts that we have to jump on, you know, whatever, reggaeton or, or, or trap music, whatever, and we don't have someone specialized in that genre, then we'll go out and look for that person. And, and don't get me wrong, we're always on the lookout for new talent. And I personally, on a daily basis, listen to pretty much everything that's submitted in the car or on my phone or whatever. Right. So we're always on the lookout for new talent and occasionally we do sign new writers, but I'd say 90% of what we do is covered by our core roster, our core team, which is a, they're an extraordinary talented group of people. Okay. Ron, what are the major issues facing the library world today? I, I just say, um, just to cue off the, the one of the panels this morning, it's, it's value. And it's maintaining value and it's educating people that music has value. And I think over the last, since the dawn of the internet, uh, the younger generation in particular has just been conditioned to believe that music is free and music doesn't have value. And why should they pay for it? And if they have to pay for it, well then, well, it's, it's a few hundred bucks and why should it be any more than that? So I think that's the biggest challenge, maintaining value. And the reason it's such a challenge is because there's so many upstart companies out there that just throw up a website without thinking, just thinking they're going to make a quick buck. And they just position themselves as brokering content and brokering content non-exclusively or putting up a buyout library. And there's composers out there who don't know the value of their music. And they willingly give away music to companies and companies will hire them for 50 bucks a track or in Europe, you know, uh, uh, 25 euros a track or whatever. And they just don't know the value of their music because they're so desperate to get into the business. And these are the companies that are really uh, undermining it for, 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 the rest, for the rest of us uh, because it's hard to compete with free and it's hard to compete with, you know, 25 bucks uh, a buyout track that you're downloading from a website. And so this is the problem. Fortunately, we, we still have the quality difference, the quality card that we can play and the service card and the cur your curation card that we're playing and we're still succeeding, we're still thriving. But, but still, it's, it's, it's a plague upon the industry uh, what's going out there. That there's so many people who are uneducated, unaware of the value of the music that are just throwing stuff out there to try to make a, a quick buck. Some really great pieces of information coming from Ron, especially for those of you who are interested in forming your own music library to license music. So, insiders, here's the question of the day. What were the most relevant things that Ron spoke about in our discussion regarding music libraries? Was it the changing role of music libraries in film and television today? Or was it the growth of many new platforms and outlets in today's visual media landscape? Or maybe it was something else that connected with you. If you have any ideas or experiences that you'd like to share regarding this video, we'd love to hear from you and connect in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching this video. Make sure to subscribe to Mubu TV for more information on how to educate, empower, and engage your music career. You can also check out a summary of this episode and everything we talked about in the YouTube description as well. And if you enjoyed this video, we'd really love it if you hit the like button and let us know what other kinds of videos and types of content you would like to see on our channel. Hit us up in the comments below, and we'll see you in the next video.